Okay, hopefully you can see a PowerPoint. Yep. Okay, so today I'm just going to move things slightly to the side so you can see my PowerPoint. Um, so this is going to be a session looking at blended asynchronous and synchronous online learning. So um, I'll tell you what I'd like to co cover and what we might do together. So first of all, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, talk through a, um, what blended learning is and can be and how it's, it's understood. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about the overall rationale for blending asynchronous and synchronous online learning and, and learning tools. Then I'll talk about my own work and experiences with blended learning and um, I think the majority of you will know uh, that I've been running a blended learning in a digital age course for at least 10 years. I think uh, Susan, who's here, was was on that course, so, um, and um, uh, and so I, I've been thinking about it for quite a long time. And then um, the questions and thoughts, and I have a couple of prompts which may or may not be of use, but you can say whatever you want in in relation to this. So. Blended learning, before I move on to talk about blending asynchronous and asynchronous blended learning is, or what it's understood as. So it's variously um, conceptualized. Um, you, you probably already have heard about blended learning as a face-to-face, -face, um, as combination of face-to-face on-site activities and online activities and that is the, the most common understanding of what blended learning is. But there are other ways of thinking about blended, uh, blended learning. So you can think about it in terms of blended online asynchronous learning, that's, that's learning, I'm sure you all know, but you're not learning in real time um, and um, online synchronous learning. So rather than thinking about it in terms of face-to-face -face and um, online, you're thinking of it as a combination of online asynchronous and online synchronous activities. Um, then you can think about it in terms of blended synchronous activities. And there's a lot more discussion of this. So um, by that, uh, um, you can think about it in terms of on-site students and distance students working together um, uh, in, in a blend. And there is a very nice article by, I think it's Bowers and Dolgano, and I forget the other um, authors in it, but that, but that really explores in some detail some of the potential of that synchronous blend and some of the constraints that relate to that blend. But I'm going to be focusing more on online asynchronous and online synchronous learning. You can also think about blended learning in terms of a blend of asynchronous activities with different task types and different tools related to those task types. Um, there's, there's obviously quite a, a big body of, of um, writing around this and um, I've used different writings variously in the course um, but one of the understandings of blended learning and the dynamics of blended learning comes from Little John and Kegler and they talk about the space blend i.e. Uh, where learning can be located and the fact that blended learning can move away from physical space into other into other learning spaces and it's slowly expanding what we consider to be a learning space. We can think about this in terms of the time blend, 
the fact that um, uh, blended learning allows for more um, um, self-paced activities, um, uh, for more reflective activities, which I'll talk about later. So um, uh, it's, it releases people from s s uh, um, adhering to a specific time and a specific place. The media blend, how you can use different tools to set up different learning dynamics and um, an activity blend, which is thinking about the ways in which um, you can blend different types of learning activity. Um, it's also thought about in terms of blending pedagogies. So um, we tend to talk about pedagogies in isolated terms. So either you adopt a constructivist mode uh, of, of learning or you, you adopt a situative mode or an associative behaviorist mode. And uh, what um, quite a few uh, blended learning researchers talk about is a, a mix of all of those modes so that you use one mode to enhance another mode. So there is no reason, according to um, authors like Mays and De Freitas, who have written a very, very nice, if quite old article now, on the ways of um, using these different um, um, pedagogical approaches effectively in combination, where one pedagogical approach becomes a, str a springboard for another. Um, I think it's, it's probably important to point out, so there's a really nice article which was written in 2013 by Moscow et al. Moscow talks about blended learning as a dangerous idea uh, because it, it, in some ways it can challenge um, accepted notions of what learning can be. And that probably relates to uh, a, a key, or key authors, Garrison and Kanuka, when they talk about a blend being potentially transformational. But um, in, in, Mos in Moscow et al. say something which I think is really important and which is often missing from discussion around blended learning. And that is that blended learning will be differently operationalized, I'll just come here, in, in different settings and according to the needs of the learner. So they talk about a, a blueprint blend which they think is, which they don't think is particularly useful, whereas a contextual dynamic blend is something that needs to be taken, which needs to be at the forefront of people's minds when thinking about blended learning. And I think that's a very um, important point to, to keep in mind. So everything that I'm going to be talking about is going to relate to my, ex well, the literature, but also to my experiences. And some of these things won't apply in all contexts. So the, I, I like um, Garrison and Kanuka's um, article, which was written in 2004, but I think it does a really good job of work in that it doesn't just talk about the process of blended learning, but it talks about the qualities that um, blended learning can, can bring to uh, education and the ways in which it can enhance education. So I like the fact that in, in their definition, they talk about the thoughtful integration of classroom face-to-face -face learning experiences with online learning experiences. And you can see that they have a specific understanding of the blend here. That's one where uh, they're integrating the strengths of synchronous face-to-face -face activity and asynchronous text-based internet understanding. So this was written in 2004 and I think um, uh, uh, and Kanuka were to write this now they might write it in slightly different ways so I don't think they would talk solely about text-based internet asynchronous learning. I think they would talk about asynchronous learning more generally, um, given the number of tools that are now on stream that can be used 
which is not necessarily about writing. Um, but I, I also like that phrase, integrating the strengths of synchronous and asynchronous learning, and that's something I'll come back to. Uh, and they say, uh, which I think is also a key phrase, the real test of um, this out of the, way. the real test of blended learning is the effective integration of the two main components, such that we are not just adding on to the existing existing dominant approach or methodology. And I think that that's a key point also. So. One of the reasons that um, I'm sure many of you will have seen this, um, one of the reasons they think that a blend of asynchronous and synchronous um, learning is important is that it can, um, it can help develop a community of inquiry and Garrison Kanuka um, see a community of inquiry almost as a hallmark of what higher education should be about. So if you, see, I, uh, I, if you see on screen, they talk about, um, in the left bubble, they talk about social presence. In the right, they talk about cognitive presence. Uh, and below the Venn diagram, they talk about teaching presence and how these can work together to um, create this community of inquiry for anybody who's unfamiliar uh, with this diagram. Um, in terms of social presence, uh, this creates, and I'm reading what Garrison says here, this creates the environment for trust, open communication and cohesion. Um, the cognitive presence relates to the, the extent to which learners are able to construct and confirm meaning through sustained reflection and discourse. And the teacher presence relates to the design, facilitation, and direction of inquiry. Um, so, um, oops, it's not quite explained correctly. So, all of these things, the community of inquiry is built upon and engenders interactions. It, it allows for a greater quantity of interactions. Uh, greater quality of interactions given the different dynamics um, that asynchronous and synchronous, synchronous learning can uh, engender. It, they talk about free and open dialogue and critical debate and negotiations and agreement, uh, student, greater student and teacher engagement, greater opportunities for independent and collaborative learning experiences. But all of these things, all of these things are dependent on the, the, the design of, of the, um, the blended um, uh, learning. So I think the key thing uh, that Garrison and Kanuka are saying is that without a community of inquiry on the chances for interaction, what you've essentially got is a content delivery system. Now, that doesn't mean to say you can't have interactive elements in content if you design um, quizzes, if they're really well formulated quizzes which allow for meaningful, immediate feedback, then you know, a content, content delivery may have a useful function in certain situations, uh, but it doesn't allow, for example, for, it doesn't give people insights into the sense students are making of the content uh, and uh, no real positive uh, possibilities for formative feedback. I might have put etc, etc, etc there because a lot of things that this does which you simply can't do when you're, when you're just adding content to, for example, a virtual learning environment. So um, just as an intro to talking about what asynchronous tools are seen as useful for, um, and synchronous tools are seen as useful for. Um, I, I, I don't know to what extent you know all of these tools. I guess you all know discussion areas. These are asynchronous learning tools, generally. 
uh, wikis. Wikis are an old favorite of mine. I think they've been going a long time, wikis, and I still think they do a really, really good job of work in allowing people to engage collaboratively um, in, in mostly asynchronous time to formulating, for example, um, drafting and writing and all sorts of other things. They, they, they do a really good job of work and I'll come back to that later. I use a tool, Padlet. I, I'm guessing quite a, few, quite a few of you know about Padlet. It's a really lovely tool um, and it allows almost for throw down thinking, um, uh, particularly if you're short of time. I use it a lot um, to act as a bridge between the asynchronous learning and synchronous learning. Trello, which is a little bit like Padlet, I've also, by the way, these are all tools that I've used. Uh, and Trello I like, it's a little bit like Padlet, but allows for greater collaborative um, activity. I've been using it for about four years now. And it's, it's a really lovely tool. Uh, mind mapping, I know that there are now quite a few uh, synchronous mind mapping tools, but um, um, most mind mapping tools remain asynchronous, so you may know about MindMaster, but Coggle is a lovely tool which I use quite a bit, and also XMind, which I haven't put down here. I'm guessing, you know, um, I, I use social networking in the background more as a means of back channeling for kind of the, the, the conversation that's going on, which is not brought to the fore, but which is it should, which is which is if you like oiling the wheels podcasting is also mostly asynchronous things like prezi which is a, a presentation tool uh, which again has been around a long time and I, I was interested recently to see the resurgence of voice thread which i've been doing, using for years and years it's really nice um, um, uh, software which allows for conversation, for example, around videos in asynchronous time. I don't know whether they're using this asynchronously now, but it, they used to. It used to be an asynchronous um, uh, means of engaging with more visual uh, thinking. And things like e-portfolio tools, which are also um, um, asynchronous, such as Edmodo, and I'm sure you can add a significant number of other asynchronous tools to that mix. Um, synchronous learning interactive tools, um, you'll, you'll know about them, desktop video conferencing, as Gary was saying, there's a, there's, there's a lot out there. You'll know about Zoom. Uh, I'm a great fan of Adobe Connect, because um, it does, I think it does rather more than Zoom does, but it also is much heavier on uh, broad bandwidth, et cetera, and it's GoToMeeting, which I'm less familiar with, and you can add, add many um, other tools to the mix. There's a growing number of online collaborative whiteboards, and I have recently been introduced to Miro. I don't know if anybody's using Miro. That's a really nice tool. It allows for also, it allows for synchronous um, brainstorming and, and it's, it's oriented around very visual ways of, of thinking through ideas in um, synchronous space. Second Life, Gary and I have been working uh, in Second Life, well it's kind of disappeared but um, we, we, we were thinking for a long time about uh, Second Life and the nature of um, uh, virtual learning um, uh, virtual learning kind of um, uh, these animated uh, 3D areas and then virtual reality which you may know about which is you know you require a hood and you're moved into uh, an animated 3D world and they're increasingly um, orienting their work around collaborative virtual reality sessions. Just saying all of this, that there's, there is a, a increasingly a kind of hybrid uh, tools which are, are hybrid in terms in that they that they blend 
both asynchronous and synchronous features. For example, Miro is, is, is one of those. So, so um, I've kind of looked again at the literature and looked at what it's saying about the strengths of these different tools as a means of thinking about how they can be used in combination. And if you look at the left here, the strengths of asynchronous learning tools, and there's a much longer list, but um, I don't have time to talk about all that. Obviously, we can, talk, we can think about it in terms of self-paced learning. Students can study when they want uh, um, more. Uh, and this is when and where they want, and this is associated quite a bit in the literature with access, democratizing learning, and inclusive learning, particularly with those with um, you know, broadband uh, uh, access. Um, uh, it allows times, this is particularly a point made by Garrison and Kanuka et al, for critical reflection individually and collaboratively, for example, through threaded discussion. So it gives space for that more contemplative, reflective element, which you tend not to encounter in synchronous learning. Opportunities for academic writing individually and collaboratively, e.g. through Wiki, and I use Wiki a lot for it as a means of um, helping people develop their, um, their academic writing. Opportunities for tutor and peer feedback, um, asynchronous feedback, which is a different quality to the types of feedback that you give in synchronous learning. So in terms of the strengths of synchronous learning, it acts as a motivator, is one of the points that is raised quite a bit, and can save time. Um, that's a more interesting point, which we'll come back to. It allows for discussions that have energy and enthusiasm, that are spontaneous and contagious. And it's worth remembering here that Garrison and Kaluka were talking about face-to-face -face activity. And I question whether uh, uh, online synchronous spaces have the same, provide the same opportunities for spontaneous and, and contagious learning. Uh, maybe a little bit, and I have done sessions where that really has been the case, but I think it's less likely. Um, um, opportunities for questions, receiving immediate feedback, live demonstrations, live uh, visual creations. And it, it's more associated with developing a strong sense of social presence and teacher presence can be used, for example, for introductory sessions, for ice-breaking sessions. Although I think equally asynchronous learning tools can help with that. It's a very different dynamic there. So then, you know, how do you take these things and formulate them into something which um, enhances learning generally? So just to, you know, I've forgotten the slide, just to talk about, so, uh, Garrison and Canuck particularly talk about how all of this leads to greater quantity of interaction, quality of interaction, diversity of interactions, opportunities for responsiveness to students' needs. A long time ago, I had a conversation with Yip Stelmer, and I was asking him what he thought of this notion of Collis and Moonen's notion of flexible learning, and he interpreted it, interpreted it in terms of responsiveness, the capacity during the course to engage with students' ideas and perhaps to reformulate some of what you're doing uh, on the strengths or basis of those ideas and obviously more social, cognitive and teacher present. These are kind of things that you, that you would like to achieve but um, <clears throat> the question of how you achieve them is probably an interesting one. And more recently, I've been using this kind of, I just you know, think of it as a feedback loop um, <clears throat> to think through how I want to um, blend asynchronous and synchronous learning in the learning activities I engage with. And I think about that as, you know, uh, a, a kind of an initial prompt and I've used, I'm not sure, I don't know if 
who's familiar with H5P, but I can really recommend H5P. It's a great tool for creating videos, um, very good for helping you formulate really useful feedback with hints and not just yes, no responses. So you can start with something like that or with a reading text and, and then you might still use the async, asynchronous functionality for brainstorming, note-taking, formulating questions, um, which would then move you into a more synchronous mode of working, um, so where you're presenting ideas, for example, relating to your brainstorming, um, uh, responding to the ideas of students and um, tutors, creating questions, and then prompts for further exploration. And you'll see here that <clears throat> this moves the kind of this, these, these preparatory stages allow for a much more, well, they, they should allow for a much more dynamic um, online seminar in, 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 rather than these very, um, what, doing what I'm doing now, uh, just, you know, presentation mode you, they, where, where, where students are more involved. Then you might go back and think about kind of asynchronous consolidation of what you've done in a synchronous meeting, um, and that that would you know that could be writing, that could be um, um, reflecting more deeply on some of the ideas that have that you've you've been thinking about with other people, and reflecting on those with others, and then you might move again to a synchronous session where you present your um, you, you, the ideas that you've been reflecting on so you take those reflections and then you articulate it and that in turn might lead to a where to next uh, conversation which might account for the responsiveness that i was talking about before so you've done all of these things where might that conversation go next and that um, ideally what you want is for the students to make those suggestions uh, but um, without 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 students doing that you can still you can still say okay I think this leads on to and back again to the asynchronous prompt so that is that is more the way I am working with it in terms of blending asynchronous and synchronous learning now um, I'll just keep going because that, that gives us more time to have a conversation around this. Um, so I've used a, a variety of different ways of doing this and some are things that I've, that I've done in the past and some are things that I've done more recently. So I, I've used asynchronous brainstorming of assessment ideas followed by online presentations for formative and summative feedback, followed by an asynchronous consolidation of ideas. So just that, that same kind of circular um, um, dynamic. Uh, I have quite recently, over the last two years, I've been using individual and collaborative wiki activities as students prepare for assessment. assessment. Um, and that involves a lot of formative feedback. Then we move on to a tutorial, followed by more asynchronous work in Wiki. And perhaps I can just uh, share some of the work that is being done here. So to be careful. So this is work that, I hope you can see this, this is work that students have done on my Educating for Sustainability course. So they, they were asked to provide, to provide a, a, a proposal for um, something that they were going to pre present on in, in the final assessment. Susan, we, we can't see what you're showing, so... You can't? No. Okay. So if you close down or the... You need to switch windows or so stop sharing and then reshare the... If you're okay, showing... You share, just one second. Here we go. Thanks. Okay. I hope you can see that now. Yeah, we can, yeah. 
Yeah, okay, so, so this is work that was done um, with students on the Educated for Sustainability course. So it had one round where students were proposing ideas and then the next round. Um, so then they had an online seminar where we talked about these things and then they produced a second proposal uh, and this was the proposal that they took forward to um, their um, uh, assignment. And that's the thing about the wiki is this kind of palettes that you can formulate your ideas on and students can share their ideas and then you can see the feedback that was here and that feedback comes in, in after, you know, twice. So that's another... Um, um, if you like, um, formulation of this asynchronous and synchronous blend. I'm just going to show my screen again. Okay, then I've done jigsaw reading again. This is quite new, but it worked quite well. So um, students read uh, at least a couple of um, different articles, then they, they brainstormed and wrote notes about those articles in Padlet, and then we had a synchronous seminar where they shared their understandings um, with other people, and that led to a further asynchronous, well, reading activity where students read the paper that the other group had read, and that, that almost gave them a springboard into thinking through that chapter. And, and that worked really well, actually. I've also used it, I won't, I won't show this, but um, uh, as a means of prepping um, students for online guest speakers. So um, students ask questions in Padlet. So they're introduced to the work that the guest speaker is going to talk about. They read about it, they formulate understandings, and then they generate questions so that when they engage with the speaker, they've already got a good sense of what they might say. And one of the things that I think, <coughs> excuse me, this does, is um, the students quite like that, um, or at least the students that I've been working with at the moment, quite like that preparation and quite like the fact that they've got something to say so that they're not put on the spot. And that also has worked quite well. Um, there are loads of issues with doing this. I mean, it sounds kind of, kind of clean, but it, it's, it's, it's not. Um, it, it can be terribly time consuming for both with students and teachers, and it requires an awful lot of teacher presence. Um, it's, you, know, you all know this, it's difficult to arrange synchronous meeting times, and that is a perennial problem, which um, I can talk about how I'm thinking about that now, and you will be thinking about it in different ways. Um, expectations, students' expectations for an immediate response is an asynchronous work. This is something that's changed over the years, um, um, because I, when I started this, we used to have these huge um, discussion threads where everybody would contribute ideas, and this generated a lot of opportunities for re reflection and contemplation, um, and it was great, actually. Um, but I found that um, students are increasingly less enthused by the more asynchronous aspects of the brand, preferring the synchronous aspects of the brand. And I don't know if other people, I, I think we've had that conversation in the DTC group where this is certainly the, the case. And I think actually that's a loss, but um, um, so I'm thinking about ways of reinstituting that more reflective work. Students who are infused, and there are always students who are infused and, and write, you know, long discussion um, um, posts, and then they find that they, those um, posts are not responded to other than by the tutor. I think they, they, they don't particularly like that. Um, increased, students can come unprepared for synchronous meetings which means that some of the things that you want them to do, they're, they're not able to do, which is, um, you know, you, you do what you can with, with what you have, but it, it, does, um, it does interrupt interrupt the dynamics. 
and it, it, it can be difficult to generate the spontaneous conversations, enthusiasm, which is supposed to be the strength of synchronous seminars because of the greater need to negotiate things like turn taking, which you all know about. Um, so ways of dealing with the issues and response. Um, so um, one of the ways which I've talked about is doing less time consuming asynchronous tasks pre a synchronous meeting and doing the more reflective activities after the meeting. Uh, encouraging students to choose, choose the, tool, the tools they use for asynchronous conversations with peers so that uh, whatever tool they're using they feel, they feel is more integrated in, in, in the ways that they work anyway so they see it less as, a, as an added burden to what they're being asked to do. Um, telling students what aspects of the activities you'll engage with so if people are working with in WhatsApp, actually personally I don't really want, I want to know less about that uh, than I do uh, seeing what they've made of that later on. Um, so um, yeah, so, so, so deciding where students will work on their own without you contributing as a tutor. Um, setting expectations for response time and the rationale for slower pedagogical approaches in what feels increasingly to me like a very sound bite world. And I, increasingly I'm talking about the need for what I perceive as the need for that more reflective and contemplative engagement. Uh, where appropriate, and this is, uh, this is very useful in terms of, um, um, well, for many reasons which we're going to now, where appropriate, ask students to act as moderators for threaded discussion topics. Um, they quite like that, and um, it, it tends to, um, it, it, you tend to get more people engaging with um, um, the asynchronous activities when that's happening, in my experience. Uh, run a synchronous session for each main theme or topic so that you've got this, this continual dynamic which I think helps to, to, to motivate what's, um, students to engage in the synchronous sessions. Work out at the beginning of the course with students the three possible times for synchronous meetings and make use of that range. Um, so. Um, you, you know, I, 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 th I think that can be quite useful, A, because it allows difference, it, if, if people can't uh, attend one synchronous session, then they can probably attend another. So if you, if you use those different time slots, um, that can be quite useful in keeping people engaged. Um, yeah, so um, this, this spontaneous conversation, I think that's one of the key attributes of the blend that I'm talking about, that it allows for that greater spontaneous conversation in the actual synchronous area. Right, that's me done. Um, here is a very nice Bauer and Dalgano article, it's lovely. Here is Garrison and Kanuka, which I've been talking about. Um, and right. Going to leave it open to questions and anything that you. I have put two prompts there in case those are of interest to you, um, um, which will uh, engender this conversation. I think I will stop. So, can you see opportunities for blended asynchronous and synchronous learning in your own context? And Moscow et al. say that blended learning will be differently operation, operationalized according to context. What aspects of your context will need to be taken into account? So I'm going to stop sharing now and hand it over to, to people. So I know it takes time to for people that so I it takes time for people to formulate questions, and I've been told you, you always wait 10 seconds before, <laughs> before saying anything. So, yeah, Jaco, sorry, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name. Uh, th thank you, uh, uh, Susan. So, my questions will, of course, not be very refined while others are making up their minds, but first come, <laughs> first serve, you know, early birds. Um, I've got too many, but two, um, perhaps, 
uh, for, for the sake of structure, one a little bit around uh, synchronous activities and then a one a little bit about asynchronous activities, two things that will probably help me. The first one is uh, just an overall observation that um, the moment where we are at the moment is most colleagues are dealing with this transition from a face-to-face -face teaching mode to a blended or an online teaching mode. So. Um, we, we, we have to acknowledge that, that not everybody is going to go through the steep learning curve as quickly and easily as possible. And, and, and therefore, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think through what would be uh, low hanging fruit, easy uh, gains to be made as you think through this blend of, of, of the two. Uh, so, so the first one is um, the kind of tool that we're using now, desktop video conferencing tools. Um, one, of the, one of the things that's really uh, uh, unhelpful about a tool like Zoom or GoToMeeting or many of, of these kind of tools, fantastic as they are, is that they are still a little bit um, centralized around the host or the moderator of the conversation. And um, to build in the element of a bit more social learning um, is, is really, really difficult, particularly um, to have what I've recently seen last week at, a, at an online conference that we did. Um, is this ability to do sidebars or private conversations or conversations where people in your, in your group can decide, I want to have a chat with these five people and, and say something on the side kind of thing. So my, my first uh, question then is about these synchronous interactions, whether you're aware of tools that can give that type of functionality to, to have a bit more of a spontaneous, less lecturer-centered, more student or participant-centered approach to do these kind of things. That's the first one. Uh, the second one then again about the asynchronous elements. Yeah, just some reflections from you would be really great because of your experience with Padlet particularly. Um, if we want to build this element of uh, critical reflection on your own practice, if we want to build that into our students, which is certainly I teach only master students, uh, so that's what we want to do. Um, and I want to just ask for your reflections on Padlet as a tool for that individual reflective journal activity, what you would experience to be the strengths and the limitations of that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And if anybody else wants to, to, to respond as well, I mean, there's a lot of expertise here, so uh, I, can, I can start responding and, and, and bring other people in if that, if that would be useful. So, yeah, the, 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 the notion of that more, more social aspect of um, think, uh, you know, um, video desktop conferencing tools like Zoom. Um, so I, um, sometimes if you, if you label something a social activity, um, you're more likely to get kind of social engagement through that activity. So I, I think it relates in some ways to, to what you're saying about it um, and how you're talking about what's going to be happening. So if you say prior to a session, this is going to be a social session, we're going to have breakout rooms, you're going to meet and greet, um, you're going to do these ice-breaking activities. And ice-breaking activities can be done quite well in these types of environments. It's not like a face-to-face -face environment, but, but you can do that. So um, I think if you say this, this is going to be a social activity and you use breakout rooms, um, that, that's quite useful. Also a lot of, you'll see at a lot of conferences, people use backtrack, back channeling such as Twitter, and that allows uh, a, for a, uh, allow, so you, you, you add in the a asynchronous elements, so the synchronous and asynchronous elements are working uh, in combination. Um, that can be quite useful, so, so the, the, the social element goes on in a slightly different place, and then that, that social element is threaded through into, into Zoom. Um, um, I, I, there may be other people who um, have other points to 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 who may be able to bring other points there. But um, also the in the initial asynchronous work is quite useful. So for for that synchronous work, coming back to this notion of the blend. In terms of Padlet, yes, I have used Padlet 
for reflective activities. So um, I've had students who have been going to, for example, DigiLab at the library, and we used Padlet for them to talk about their, their experiences. I, I set up some prompts, they talked about their experiences, what those experiences meant, and how they were uh, bringing those experiences into their understanding of this was in a course for multimedia design and development. Um, I've done the same thing for a museum visit where people went to the uh, Manchester Museum and then they did the same thing. I set up props, prompts and they used these prompts to uh, reflect on their experiences. So you can use it in, in that way and, and it works quite well. Different, um, has different, if you, if you like, layouts and you can use those layouts um, in order to thread the conversation. So if people see that a, a critical reflection, if you're thinking more in collaborative terms, if they see that somebody else has said something really interesting and they want to add to that, then you can, they can link that to their own, um, uh, their own thinking. So it is quite interesting in, in those terms. So yes, I think it could be used for critical reflection. I mean, to be honest, I use it more to, to slap things down, but I have used it in those terms. Um, the low-lying fruit would be to start simple, use one and another, and then add more tools as you go along, particularly if people are, you know, moving from, moving to a different dynamic, um, starting simple um, and then adding tools as we go through the course would be my recommendation. That's certainly what I've done in the past. Um, I don't know if anybody else has anything to add to that. Uh, Shall I say a couple of things if you want? Yeah. I mean, I think it, as much as anything, it depends on how you use a tool like Zoom. I mean, uh, and, and, and what you do with it, it's, it's, I mean, if you make it sort of interactive, uh, you can also add elements into it. So I did a session with the Teach First group uh, a few weeks ago now, and, and we used, for example, uh, we shared Google Docs for, for the, uh, the different groups to use uh, for, for their, you know, brainstorming collection of ideas and Susan mentioned the idea of a back channel I mean essentially I mean it depends on, on what you have available and what the students have available I mean if you uh, I mean you could you could I mean we've now got access to Microsoft 365 so the tool Yammer which is a discussion forum that, that features as part of that could be designated for a course uh, back channel for example and then you could share that so you as as the person or somebody else within within the uh, environment could share that and bring that in so people could be having these discussions outside i mean you can chat privately um in the uh, in obviously as you're well aware in the zoom chat but it's only between sort of one to one but you could have that you could preset those sorts of things up Mentimeter, for example, has that kind of facility. So it partly depends on how you set it up. It's about designing the tasks so that they, you know, they allow the, the, the people, the students, the participants to do what you want them to do. So I think, uh, I mean, uh, I've sort of, you know, we can introduce lots of different tools, but if people are not used to those tools, uh, then I think that that can be you know, that can be overwhelming. So pick something you're familiar with and you're happy with or find out what the students are happy with. Actually, there's a better way of doing it. So, you know, if they're mostly overseas students uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, I always come back to our Chinese students and they're using something like WeChat, just tell them to get on with doing it through that. You can be part of that community. And if you want to share that at any point, they can or they can share their group activity. So it's quite easy for them to set up little mini groups within a space like that. Uh, like it is uh, in, in a tool like WhatsApp, which I don't use with my students, um, and then they could sort of share what they've been talking about as, as part of it or not, as the case may be. So, you know, it's how you integrate those tools in, but it's, it's very much led by how you, you want the design to work. So H5P, which Susan mentioned, fantastic tool, but it's quite a learning curve. Um, 
but you know once you get into it it provides you with all sorts of interactive yeah. poss possibilities but you may not want to invest it in, in into doing that it partly depends on what you want to do so that would be maybe gary you should do something you know a video on h5p i don't think it's that Tough. It's not that tough, but it, 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 if people are coming from, you know, I mean, we have to remember how long we've been doing this. Certainly I've been doing it too long. Um, and, you know, I mean, my knowledge of tools is quite extensive, but I do try and circle around a, a relatively small community of tools. And I'm as much as anything driven by uh, what our students find useful. Uh, that's where I tend to to start. So I try and find out what they like to do, and then go with them. So you could then have that sidebar, as as you're calling it, uh, Jaco. It, it, you know, they they create their own sidebar, and that's how I I I try and do it in teaching and learning online. One of the modules I run, uh, I say, okay, pick a tool and, and and share it within that community, and then they can you know you can say go out now to your you know local tools and, and and discuss this point and then come back so you don't even have to use the breakout rooms necessarily so i've got a question from loretta how can we best ensure students are committed and follow through with non-live elements i i mean personally i think the blends that i'm thinking of is is one way of it, of ensuring that um people do engage with those non-live elements because it's what Garrison and Kanuka call a seamless integration of asynchronous and synchronous activities, which in some ways, um, if, if you use the asynchronous activities to motivate synchronous activities and the synchronous activities to act as a springboard for the asynchronous activities, my my experience is you're more likely to get um, that, that greater um, engagement with the asynchronous activities, particularly the post-synchronous um, um, work where people leave enthused and they do actually leave enthused and, and go for, for the most part and then go and write things down and think about it. And so I think in some ways that's the strength of the blend that it allows for that um, greater asynchronous and synchronous engagement. So when they're blended together, I think it helps with that. I've never made anything compulsory. Never. I, I just think, you know, if people don't want to or they have, you know, we work with a lot of distance students who have very busy lives. So I've never said, well, you, 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 you've got to do this. My, my, my personal hope is that people will do it because they find the activity interesting. And if we don't get everybody engaging, and kind of that's okay. Um, but if you get, where it becomes an issue is if you get one or two people engaging the whole time and it, and it looks like that's happening, then, then, you know, to be honest, you might as well just move to the, uh, uh, I've just got a note saying my internet connection is unstable. Um, um, you might as well move to just doing delivery content and synchronous work. But I think you will be losing so much by not engaging with that asynchronous work because the best reflections, I mean, some of the best work I had, uh, that I've seen I saw 10 years ago with some lovely reflective analysis and that that's disappearing and i think that is a shame because i think um, um, it's a very very useful element i hope that answers your question i don't know if anybody wants to add to that I mean, I could say, I mean, just, I mean, Drew, I, we know, uh, obviously, you probably know Drew Whitworth works on the DTC on, on two of his modules on, on the, the kind of core, one of the core modules, he does assess uh, the actual contributions to the forums. So he does do that. And, and both Susan and I maybe come from an older school of, of working where we, we tend to shy away from that. But he also uses this, he mentioned this in, in the session that he did. Um, was it on Monday? Yes, sorry, my week has been very long. Um, uh, he, he uses what he calls stewarding points, and that sort of fits in with his sort of theoretical framework, uh, the Communities of Practice framework. And he essentially, he awards points uh, for, say, contributions to Twitter. So 
we mentioned Twitter, so he uses Twitter. He's talking about media and information literacy, so inevitably people kind of engage with these things uh, to a greater extent than the, perhaps they might do in, in other programs. Uh, but but you know, it, it's it's part of selling it. I mean, I, I work with undergraduate students um, on one module, uh, and again, getting them to engage. Uh, you know, in activities that are outside of the classroom can be tough. And I'm thinking actually of taking on board that idea of saying, okay, you know, 10% of your mark will be for, you know, the postings you do in Edmodo because, uh, you know, that's the tool I use on, on that particular course. But also if you make some postings on Twitter or you, you link into Twitter and things like this, you add a number of points. So they're not, they're not big pointage but it's a sort of it, it gives a margin and uh, and I find you know I mean I think that's you know I, I try to use a portfolio at one point um, and I sort of stopped doing it after a while because it, it got very difficult to administer but again and, and I didn't award any points for that uh, and and so people just didn't submit it but but I you know I realized that that maybe putting a few points into the the scale uh, for, for that kind of additional contribution and it means that people who really engage with uh, the course unit and maybe over fulfill or fulfill better the learning outcomes that they're being rewarded for that contribution so I'm kind of you know I'm between sort of you know the view of not doing it and and the sort of more you know the, the more significant view that, that that Drew does on ETC uh, so. I mean I have done that at um, undergraduate level where people are given the small percentage for what they do. I, I do find it changes the way that people engage though. Absolutely. So they're speaking more to the assessment than they are to reflecting on ideas. And mm. I, I, one of my, so I'm, I'm a bit of an agnostic on this, but one of my concerns is that as soon as you start doing this, you, the whole course becomes an assessment. Yeah. And, and, and that, that perturbs me more and more. I mean, I'm like the USIL course that I do, you know, increasingly the whole course is, is around assessment and that is not in the spirit of, of what I'm trying to do on that course, which is to, to get people or, or to, to work with people to think about the big issues, which is what they really like to do. And so many of them just don't really care about the assessment, contrary to to expectations, you know, what the university says about assessment. They want to talk about big issues and they really don't care about, you know, the little assess assessments here and there. So I can see the, the potential of doing this, but um, and I can see the potential of, of rewards, but I think this is a very good book, Punishment by Reward, which uh, I've sort of dipped into and um, it's saying, you know, that ultimately this reward system erodes the whole, the whole idea of education in, in, in the final analysis. So, I, 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 yeah, I'm agnostic. I don't know where I sit on that. I think that the asynchronous and synchronous work that I'm doing actually works. But it, at the point where it stops, that's the point at which I'll start doing this. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, I'm kind of agnostic as well about it, but I sort of see, uh, you know, we just had our sort of student CDT uh, feedback session, and you know, one of the the issues that was raised about, you know, you, the students don't feel they get enough um, uh, guidance on 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 doing a good assignment. I, I mean, you know, I mean take this in whatever way we want but but essentially it's and i've noticed that particularly this year that we've had a lot of questions that say how do i you know tell me exactly how i write something and i think it's the same partly for for, for these kind of discussion groups and i and i try and stay with that idea but i think you know i do think that maybe sort of a small percentage perhaps of of the overall assessment if you're thinking about kind of you know constructive alignment trying to get people to kind of think more about those things perhaps that that's worth trying so, so i'm conscious of time um and um sorry i don't want to stop people's questions but uh, but um, and i'm happy to go on i don't know whether susan is but yeah i don't be fine yeah uh, i mean I, I thought if people want to share any of their blended ideas and talk through them a bit Yes, Sue. 
I don't want to share any ideas with you. <laughs> I just wanted to ask um, if you rem say Blackboard or Zoom, can you all these different tools you've been talking about, which you use various ones, can you link them directly into so if you've got a blackboard page and you're using can you put a link in which then takes them to those pages or how does that work sorry, sorry i missed the, the last bit and so. i suppose i'm wondering whether you can can you put links so that things are so it's all kind of connected so that you have a one it's a blackboard from zoom yeah, or do you how do you do it or do you just have them all separate so if you're using the peddler one or whatever do they all or you just use them they're sort of flying around in orbit, but you give connections to them, or are they linked Well, to there, there, there are things like Padlet, um, those are part of the synchronous work that I'll do in Blackboard or Moodle, because I use Moodle quite a bit. So that's, that's all brought together. And then students normally have their Blackboard, if I'm answering the question, people normally have their Blackboards open, so they're working between the two environments. Um, so that's how I do it. Sometimes I'll share on screen the Padlet work that students have been doing and that works as, a, as a, a device for remembering what people have said. But generally I ask people to have everything set, so we've got three or four um, windows open, and so we, we maneuver between Zoom and those other areas. That, that's how I do it. Um, so it don't find you can, you can <laughs> embed them in Blackboard, but what that they'd still need to log in. Uh, so you could yeah. put within the Blackboard space, you could put you know, you could insert uh, the the link to Padlet or, or, or whatever it happens to be, um, but it, there would be a separate login. I mean, that's not true um, with with the tools that are supported by the university, but but with external ones, and that can be a pain for people. So this is why I kind of tend to to limit the number of tools I use for people who are perhaps not on a DTCE course, uh, you know, uh, we limit the number of tools that we use and I stick to ones that they might be more familiar with. But, but yeah. Yeah, it, I, it see, yes. I see it's a kind of seamless integration. Blackboard yeah. does so badly, Moodle does it much, much better. I no, think yeah. recording things, if you've done a brainstorming activity or something and you want to have that recorded to refer back to, but you've done it an outside tool, can you still, is that, or you just keep it there? It's, my head can't cope with this idea that things are still out there, kind of. Um, you can often export them. So for example, when I did a thing yesterday in Mentimeter and uh, the uh, and Heather and Nayeli did that uh, on Monday, uh, you, you get a PDF of it uh, and, and you can you can re-import that back into to Blackboard, for example. So so there is a record, but yes, it's still out there potentially unless you kind of delete it. But you you can bring those things in in uh, so that there's a there's a record of activity. And and with things like wikis and blogs, you can import those. There are there are tools like that within the Blackboard space. I mean, the opposite applies to them in that you know you might spend you might spend a whole semester working on a wiki in, in, a, in a blackboard and then at the end of the year it's gone. Um, uh, well that's not true anymore but that, that used to be the case but you know it, it's not something you can port between different sessions whereas so that's why I would tend to use external tools you know mm -hmm. but, but it's a preference. I think people are gradually going oh, Susan. I shall, think so. shall, shall we stop there? Uh, if everybody's okay, unless somebody's got yeah, I'm a happy burning to, question. You know, if anybody has any, you know, anything they want to ask me, I'm happy to um, respond asynchronously. As a, yeah, can. so uh, all the sessions are going to are recorded. We'll put up that with the PowerPoints as people know.